Thomas, I may have I may have deleted them. Is there a use? They're green now. Are they green now? Todd, can you hear us? Todd, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Okay. We're good to go. Good. Okay. I want to call the meeting to order for the regular board meeting for the Greenview Board of Education for Thursday, April 15th, 2021. Call the roll. Suzanne Arthur. Here. Todd Ireland. Here. Scott Powers. Present. Angela Reagan. Here. Teresa Wallace. Here. We have a quorum. Say the pledge. Behind you. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we don't have any invited guests this evening. Do we have any public participation? Anybody that would like to address the board? I wanna remind um, this, our regulations for addressing the board. If you would, so that we can hear you, if you would come to this table uh, where the speaker is to kind of pick up your, your voice. And also that we would like for you to limit your comments to three minutes, please. Okay, just so we can keep things moving. And if you will state your name and address when you, when you come forward. Should we I ask for 10 minutes when we do the change to the agenda at the end? I forget which way when we do that. I think so, when we ask for changes to the agenda. All right. Amber Trotter, 4347 Pueblo Trail. First of all, I would like to congratulate you, Mr. Severs, on your new position. Thank you. I do wish you all the best at Lebanon. Um, I for, want to first start off my statement with concerns. As I emailed Mr. Severs, I am concerned regarding uh, your resignation as of July. Yes, so student realignment. As parents and staff, we have expressed our concerns on certain topics that we have regarding student move. As I see in our new business in the agenda, you are all voting on the realignment tonight. If you in fact vote yes for this move, I would like to have topics addressed. Not that, or from the entire board as well as Mr. Severs. Has busing been discussed? Do we have a plan for that? Are we putting in a playground for our fourth graders? If so, when? What will discipline look like for our fourth graders? Will they receive detentions or what will the process be of discipline put in place for them? As my concern has always been, we are rushing this decision. We are rushing this decision that could be postponed a year. Yet, I do hope all of you will have the answers for these questions throughout this board meeting if it is in fact approved on. Secondly, I would like to speak to the board. As, re as written in Mr. Seavers' article through the Dayton Daily News, Lebanon had a community focus group, surveys done by parents and community members, and even a meet and greet with this to help the board decide to choose Mr. Severs for superintendent. As a parent and community member, I didn't even know this was possible, but how incredible is that, including the community and parents to help decide? So how do we make this possible for our search? The claim has always been transparency, but the track record has not always shown that, that this is gonna be a great way to include the community. When I started this journey into being an active member at board meetings, I did not plan this. I did not plan on dealing with the pushback that we have been received, that has been received. I would have to admit my breaking point was when Mr. McGrath so graciously invited Casey and I to a one-on-one -on -one meeting and basically told us he had written some things down on how, quote, how to be a productive member of the community, stating not to ask so many questions and to just let the board do its job. As you can imagine, that did not sit well, seeing all we are doing was asking questions, but evidently that is not something that we should have been doing. I'm sure all of you are aware of the Facebook group that we had constantly supplying our community about meetings has been archived. One, we cannot babysit it. And I don't really feel like it's our place to have to tell everyone what's going on. Um, but do know that does not stop me from caring about our children. I will still be in attendance of meeting and fighting for our children. However, what it does mean is that uh, the board or whoever is in charge of these needs to step up and become more transparent. Kudos on finally getting the video and audio for these meetings. However, there's absolutely no reason we cannot post the agenda somewhere on the web page, not just by request, so that the community see what is going on and being addressed at each meeting. I think this is a great way 
to have some transparency and be able to have that available for everyone. Okay, thank you for your comments, Amber. Anyone else? At this time, we all go to number two, approve the agenda. Are there any changes to the agenda? Request. Yes, Amber. I think we have decided we are not going to do that today. Um, we have an executive session at the end, so we're not going to add 10 minutes at the end today. So who decided that? Yeah. I, I'm just curious. I wasn't in on that conversation. Well, I looked around and nobody responded. And um, I, 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 mean, I personally don't mind or care. I, I guess I didn't realize that we, I, I guess I'm a little confused. So. I thought I I came in. I just got here from West Virginia. I haven't been home yet. Oh. I thought that we had talked about it, or that a couple of you had, that had got here before me had talked about it. Oh. You can always you can always vote on it. You can vote on it. You can vote on it. Okay. You can make a motion to add it, and you can vote. Okay. All right. Can we have a motion to add it? I'll, I'll, I'll second. Okay. All right. Any other changes to the agenda? I don't have any. I'm gonna add, you wanna? All right, we'll call the roll for the, uh, so you guys are moving to, to change and add 10 minutes of public participation. Yeah. Um, Will that be, let me just clarify, is that gonna be at the end of the meeting before the executive session? It'll be before. Before, before, before executive, executive session would be my, okay. Session. Just clarifying. Okay. Um, So with the changes, um, Angela Reagan? Yes. Todd Ireland? No. Scott Powers? Yeah. Teresa Wallace? Yes. Suzanne Arthur? Yes. Motion passes four to zero or four to one. All right. Um, so we don't have any other additions to the agenda. Can I get a motion to approve the agenda? I'll move. I'll second. Call the roll. Angela Reagan? Yes. In Ireland? Yes. Uh, Scott Powers? Yeah. Teresa Wallace? Yes. Motion passed by Bureau. And I say yes to. He's in that. Oh, he's in our, sorry. <laughs> he's trying to make me think I'm nuts, which I really am. But okay. All right. All right. At this time, we'll have the treasurer's report. Number one, approve the minutes from the regular board meeting March 18th, 2021. Number two, approve the March financial reports. I'll move. So, okay. okay. Lisa, all right. Are there any questions about the? All right. Angela Reagan. Yes. Todd Ireland. Yes. Uh, Powers. Yeah. Teresa Wallace. Yes. Suzanne Arthur. Yes. Motion passed five to zero. All right. Number four, the superintendent's update. Number one, present the report of input received through thought exchange. Number two, present the learning recovery and extended learning plan. Um, so I have that I'll put up on the screen. Um, what we did um, following the last board meeting was we shared information um, and we asked for input on those things. And so, um, Board, I sent this to you already. I don't know if you had a chance to look at it. This presentation is what I sent. For the community, um, it, is always, it is also um, on the website currently under um, our news and announcements. Um, so you can see this exact presentation um, and go back and visit it. I will not be looking at all of the things here, but I just want to share with you what we received. Um, let's see if I can make this work. Coming. There we 
Ernest, slow the signal. Uh, Todd, can you see that on your end? Yes, I can. Okay. So the the exchange was um, put out and um, information was requested. The question that was asked was, please share your thoughts on the possible building realignment of Greenview schools. What are the benefits? What are some of the challenges that you see? In addition to this, I created videos talking about what would the fourth grade experience look like at the middle school? What would the eighth grade experience look like at the high school? What are some of the other impacts um, that come as a result of that? So we shared information um, prior to asking for their input. And um, this is, I uh, just wanna go through some of these things. So um, in terms of the, the people that participated, that's a little bit small. I'll see if I can increase it a little bit for you. 32% um, of our participants were staff members. 15%, um, uh, 28 of those participants were third grade parents. Um, we had eight seventh grade parents participate in the thought exchange. Um, 28 community members. 38 elementary parents, which, um, you know, not specifically third grade, could be others, um, other middle school parents or 14 other high school parents. So we had a wide variety of input. Um, most of the input came from our staff, 32%, uh, and then the second most were um, elementary parents, uh, actually 20 and 15 is 35. So uh, that gives you a demographic uh, look at who participated. Um, the, the first question, everybody who participated was asked to provide, um, their answer for, um, the eighth grade move, whether they support it. Uh, this was the feedback we received. Um, 33% of our participants thought the eighth grade move, uh, made sense or the circumstances and didn't see any concerns. Um, 28% thought the benefits outweighed any concerns they had. Um, that's a total of 61% of the participants there. 19% um, had their concerns outweighed the educational benefits. 10, they saw no benefits and they had concerns. Um, and then 20 people participated, but they didn't really have an eighth grade opinion. Um, you'll see the same thing with the fourth grade move as well. Um, So these are all I want to I want to point out, like the thing that Thought Exchange does is it collects all the information for us. As soon as it's closed, it produces the graphs, it produces the thoughts and the bands of them and the rankings. Um, these first few slides here, the, you know, the reason that they have the Thought Exchange logos and things, they were all created by Thought Exchange. So I, I just for transparency purposes, this wasn't me calculating data on a survey. Um, it came in. 27% um, uh, didn't see a concern with the fourth grade move to the middle school. 21% thought the benefits outweighed um, their concerns. 15% had concerns and they outweighed the benefits. And 23% saw no benefit and they had concerns. Um, additionally, we had 14% that didn't participate or thought it didn't apply to them or they had no opinion. What we did as administrators is we looked at this information. Um, you know, Mr. Kasner uh, is a math teacher um, by, you know, by, by trade. Those of us who know and been around Mr. Kasner, um, you know, we started talking about it. There are, there are people in both of these um, survey questions that said, I don't have an opinion. Um, so what's the percentage if you remove those people from, uh, from the discussion? How many supported it um, of those who had an opinion? So the next slide was created by our, our district administration in terms of um, removing those people out of the way. Um, the eighth grade moved to the high school. The 36% uh, had no concerns. 32% their concerns were, um, were outweighed by the benefits, 21 and then 12. I know that doesn't add up to 168 and 33, but a rounding error there of the computer um, created that problem. Um, the fourth grade moved to the middle school. Uh, 56 percent were um, in support of it. They thought the benefits were um, beneficial and 44 percent opposed the move. Um, so we, we thought um, from that feedback, uh, we heard from people, we gave them an opportunity. But in addition to just the rankings of those um, those items, what were things that came and you know, what were thoughts that came out? Um, and um, 
This is created by Thought Exchange, and these are some of the top thoughts um, that were ranked. Uh, you see the top, th this was number one out of 167. You can see over here on the right hand side. Um, number two was similar to number one. So it removes it out of the discussion and it went down to another, you know, another unrelated topic. So that's why you have one, three, six, and nine there. Um, the other things that are missing um, are similar to these answers. Um, the, the question there at the top being an elective intervention, three out of the seven periods um, instead of core academic is not educationally sound for this age group. Um, overwhelmingly, the people that were opposed to this were really concerned about the amount of time in a core instructional class. Um, that, was, uh, that was the concern that, was, that rose to the top is, um, are we focused more on um, electives than we are on academic cores? Um, and, and like you've said, I've said to you, some of that's a misunderstanding about what those other opportunities may be for the kids that need it. Um, some of those elective periods is an additional period of reading or an additional period of math um, or the intervention period. I'll talk about how that's uh, utilized currently with fifth graders and what it would look like with fourth graders. Um, the second one um, is I'd like to hear the fourth grade teacher's perspective hearing the pros and cons of the move from, the, from them would be beneficial to me. Um, I've met with the fourth grade teachers twice. Mrs. Callowert has met, met with them um, on multiple occasions and um, they've provided input on, um, onto the pro, into the process. Um, I don't wanna speak for the fourth grade teachers. And so please hear me when I say I'm not speaking for them, but those conversations um, started with, um, I have questions and I have concerns. And as that plan was communicated to them and what it would look like, and they had opportunities to share some of those concerns, um, the fourth grade team has um, come back and, and many of them have shared they're excited about the opportunity and think that it could be beneficial um, in that shift. They're not here to speak for themselves this evening, um, but we have met with them. We, we, we have communicated with them in the same way um, we've met with eighth grade team as well about that process. Um, they've had an opportunity to share um, and to be a part of the discussion uh, with administration. Um, the, the second, the third one down there um, is really the vast majority of the community supports and appreciates the board and superintendent service and support that they provide to the um, district. Um, however, uh, part, a large part of the community, current and former staff, parents do not support this realignment. This proposal should be postponed. postponed. I want to speak about postponement for a second and what the impact of waiting here would do um, because we've discussed that as an administration. Um, one, of these, one of the driving forces for the discussion that started the process for us as an administration was um, we must find a way to increase numbers and I'm gonna specifically speak to agriculture, um, our ag classes right now. Um, ag, Mr. Wickline is a teacher provided by the Greene County Career Center. Um, the enrollment this year in his program is very low. And a lot of that is due to COVID and some of those kids you know, not being there. Um, the Career Center has given us one year to increase the numbers in that program or the program, they, they would not offer that going forward. That one year is next year. Um, we must find a way to have more students um, taking agricultural classes um, at Greenview High School or not this coming year, but the following year, that will be a program that the Career Center would not offer to our students um, at Greenview High School. So by, by delaying this for a year, that obviously we're talking about one program, but the the sentiment is the same for those other things as well. If we don't have kids taking, as many kids taking uh, business, for example, or engineering um, and finding ways to populate those, then we're running the risk of losing it for the kids that have it because we can't um, generate the students to take those courses. Um, so delaying the decision for a year um, actually puts the programs at risk. Uh, that is a discussion that we have had We've had it as late as last Friday as an administrative team, um, and uh, it was very clear to us that, that that is the position of the Greene County Career Center. And so we believe that's a program we, we need to continue to offer for our students. 
Um, and that is one of those things that numbers drive decisions in terms of programming. And by making this program available to eighth grade students, it gets them hands-on learning opportunities in the eighth grades and elective they don't currently have now. Um, it also allows us to maintain the program and to build our numbers where we drive interest to that program earlier on. Um, so um, we have discussed delaying it for a year. Uh, there, are, there are concerns with that um, because of what that means. To the, program. Um, the other thing, this last one, these are just the top kind of area the ideas here. Um, is there any way we can get all three schools on a similar schedule starting and ending times? Um, having multiple kids on different schedules is challenging. Um, transportation wise, that is not possible unless we go back to a single bus for everybody. Um, that aligning those times, the reason we have a big gap in the morning is because we need time to run our routes um, and go pick those kids up. And in the afternoon, the reason there's an hour gap, we're pushing it you know, in that hour to get everybody dropped off and get back to our elementary school. So the, the split in timing allows us to, to be able to keep things in different routes. Um, it also, in that gap in the morning is when we drive kids to programs in Bellbrook or we drive kids to programs in Xenia. And so we can employ fewer drivers and have fewer buses on the road um, by doing those split routes. So um, a part of this plan would not be to put everybody on the same schedule like we used to be and put everybody back on the same buses. Um, so I felt like these things, um, you know, needed some uh, response. They were, they were the top thoughts that were, came up. Um, but what I also did in this and what I'll share with you as you go down further, um, you can in this program search for those who supported an eighth grade move, what were their top thoughts? Um, and so those who supported an eighth grade move, um, you know, they were excited about the possibilities of new elective courses. Um, it gives students uh, staying in our buildings more specials, which means more interest in learning, giving them some opportunity. You know, if you're not interested in coming to learn math and, and English and language arts, um, you, you have something that's a draw for you in those hands. Um, so you can see some of these um, thoughts here. This is the people that supported the eighth grade move. Um, and I'll go through those that didn't support it. And I'll do the same thing for fourth. Um, So those were the top um, five uh, ranked themes for um, those that supported the move uh, of eighth grade. Um, wait a second. Here are additional thoughts along those same lines. Can I skip something here? Um, this showed up in this, even though it was about eighth graders. Um, one of the things that was mentioned and, and received um, good reviews in this area was a comment fourth and fifth grade on the same floor can help keep those grades more sheltered and feeling younger. Um, this would benefit the fifth graders as well. You know, since I began in this role, there have been people that have felt like fifth grade at the middle school was too young. Um, having fourth and fifth grade and the discussions with Mrs. Callower even is it allows fourth and fifth grade to operate um, almost individually as a separate school upstairs um, from sixth and seventh. Um, so to answer one of um, Mrs. Trotter's questions from earlier, you know, when you have fourth and fifth graders on the same floor, and they're not intermingled with the sixth and seventh graders and you create a different culture on that floor that's more tailored to younger students, um, then you can do discipline differently with the students in that situation. Um, you can, um, you can, you know, it's age appropriate uh, for that. Mrs. Callower is has experience working with younger grades in previous districts that she's worked in, and you know that just like we do in kindergarten, we treat kindergartners differently than fourth graders, and you know those sort of things that allows for those 
um, differences to be uh, to be aligned. So, um, am I prepared to tell you what the discipline plan is for all of those people? No. Um, will it be age appropriate? And um, has that been a discussion that has happened already with middle school administration? Absolutely. Um, the other thing to keep in mind in all of this is um, I have the utmost respect and confidence in our fourth grade team that is currently teaching at Greenview Elementary School. Um, those individuals care about kids and those individuals know the minds and the behaviors and the capabilities of fourth grade kids. Moving them out of the elementary school and into the middle school doesn't change who they are as people. Um, and, and I want to make sure that I speak on behalf of our staff that um, some of those concerns about whether fourth graders are going to be forced to grow up too quickly um, falls solely on the responsibility of the teachers in those classrooms, how you interact with kids on a daily basis. What, what your classroom rules are, all of those things. And I have confidence that those people will, will acclimate kids to a building just like they do with the fourth grade where they begin to ratchet up expectations from third graders. Um, but fourth and fifth grade on the same floor allows that uh, to have a different feel upstairs than downstairs. Um, so, um, those are some thoughts that were provided in the highest rank for the people that were in support of this decision to move eighth grade. Um, I'm not, this isn't one-sided. I'm trying to give you the full look at this. So those who were opposed to the idea, um, we ranked those as well. These were the ones that were in opposition of the move to eighth grade um, to the middle school. Um, one of the things that I did not spend time doing in the videos was talking about all of the discussions we had about other options. Um, some of those other options are not, are not feasible or not possible. Um, did we consider moving? Um, it's been asked, even um, staff members have asked the question, could we shuffle buildings? Is this about space? Could we move people in buildings? Um, that discussion lasted about five minutes because all of our elementary classrooms that were originally science classrooms, that were originally shop classrooms, they have been converted. The gas and the water has been turned off in the kindergarten rooms currently that used to be science labs. That's not an inexpensive proposition to add science labs back to a building. Um, what used to be ag and wood shop and those sort of things is now preschool classrooms. You know, program, we have transformed that space to make it an elementary school. It is not possible to put a high school back there. Um, but the other part of that is it doesn't address a programming issue. Moving buildings doesn't change whether we have enough kids to take a class um, or a full schedule of classes or not. All it does is shuffle where the go where the openings are. Um, you know, so so those other options that were discussed in the videos in passing, we, we considered them, but there were major roadblocks to that that, um, don't, that don't address the issue. Adding, adding trailers to the elementary school um, fixes a space problem at the elementary school, but it does nothing about programs. Um, this is not a decision driven by space. This is a decision driven about ac academic offerings and programs for our students. Um, I wanna be clear, it does address a space problem that we have. You know, our elementary is crowded. Um, this does address that, but it's not the, the impetus for the discussion. So those other options were really about space um, and, and doesn't, did not address um, the, uh, the, the barriers to that. Um, There, there's been feedback that has been listened and heard from former staff members, from current staff members, um, and those things have been taken into consideration. I think that's the role um, that our people play in this, um, and uh, those are some things that have been taken into consideration. Um, you know, this third third option here, instead of you and the Career Center and College, Cross, College Credit Plus as competitors, we should explore ways to expand our partnerships with these programs. Um, we, we have explored those options, but the issue is 
we have a fewer number of students to take those programs. Um, you know, could we offer more things that are career tech offerings at Greenview High School? You know, yes, but it further dilutes the number of students taking the classes. I mean, it, there are only so many seat, you know, only so many kids to take the courses. Um, and as those numbers decrease, we either cut the programs or we find ways to make them available to other people. College Credit Plus and the Career Center are not going away. Um, we are working at the high school to increase the number of college credit plus, plus courses that we are able to offer in-house. For example, next year we will be able to offer, um, you know, Western, we can offer two college social studies courses, one in American history, one in Western civilizations. Um, we have two teachers that are licensed to teach those things. So we don't have enough students to offer them both at the same time. So they're on rotating years, alternating years. Um, we will be able to offer additional language arts um, literature courses next year, but that requires our staff members to have a master's in the content area, not a master's of education, a master's in English or a master's in mathematics. Um, those programs are long. They're difficult programs. Um, they cost a lot of money. And so the district's either going to have to pay to send people to the certifications which is a master's level courses and program where we you know, do what we can with the staff that we have to compete. So um, those are things that have been brought up that we've discussed. So um, a couple things, um, the current third graders are not prepared and will not have enough time to prepare for the move to the middle school. Um, one of the things that we have discussed as administrative team and we have planned for that is what do we do to help prepare fourth graders for going to the middle school? Um, we provide opportunities for them to go see the building while they're in school. We take a field trip and we go over. Um, they talk about what the middle school experience is going to be like. They have meetings and they see the space during school. Um, those are things that we would provide for third and fourth graders. A third grade student leaving the elementary for the last time this year, if that's the decision that is made, is going to have the same end of, end of building experiences that the fourth graders have had in the past. Um, open houses, things this summer, we are looking at offering opportunities in the building this summer at the middle school to have kids in there working with the fourth grade teachers in the spaces that they will be in, you know, and as a way of getting them familiar with the building and the staff members that are there. Um, you, you prepare those things. Those are discussions and those are plans that we already have in works. Our administrations have been working behind the scenes. So if this decision is made this evening, tomorrow, these plans become you know, rolled out. Um, the fourth grader on the bus with, um, you know, older kids, based on how school is scheduled and the amount of space that we have on school buses to move fourth through seventh graders and put them all on the bus with elementary students. We have run the numbers. We don't have enough space to make kindergarten through seventh grade one route. Um, we, we, <coughs> were asked, could fourth and fifth grade run at a different time than sixth and seventh grade? Um, logistically, that's a nightmare to have upstairs running on one schedule that starts an hour and a half later than downstairs um, because they're going to come an hour and a half later and come into the building. <coughs> staff that is there and works in the whole building, your principals, your office staff, all of those things, their day just got two hours longer that we have to pay them for that two hours of longer time as well. So um, operating fourth and fifth grade on one schedule upstairs and sixth and seventh grade on one schedule downstairs it is not logistically um, something that uh, we, we feel that we can do. And adding four through seven to an elementary bus route is too many kids on a bus route um, for the number of buses and routes that we have. Because our five through 12 bus routes are already <coughs> less than the elementary, adding fourth grade to that bus route um, fits in terms of timing. So we have evaluated, I've met with Mr. Um, uh, Mr. Morgan, our transportation supervisor. We've looked at numbers. Um, 
there's no way for us without completely redoing the the length of days and how things are done um, for us to to do transportation differently without completely changing our schedules in those days. So um, I'm telling you after the discussion, after looking at this fourth through 12th grade on bus route. Now, keep in mind, part of the reason we're having to make this decision is we have fewer than 100 11th and 12th graders in the building um, you know, to begin with. And those students are riding the bus anyway. Um, at that point in time, because most of them are driving uh, at that point in time. So most of our rap, most of our bus riders at the high school um, are eighth and ninth grade students. So um, that's one of those questions that's been asked of us. We've done those, um, that information and we, we, there's no other way for us to do it without completely blowing up the schedule um, for all buildings. Um, so those are some things that came out uh, from the from the groups that were in opposition to the eighth grade move. These are the ones that were in support of the fourth grade move. These were their top thoughts. Um, I've been I'm going to scroll through this fourth and fifth grade. We already talked about that. Um, excited to see the possibilities of new elective courses that can be offered. Um, Um, this this decision by administration, um, and I want to say to you that um, I wanted to make sure that you as a board and our administrators had all the information possible before a decision was made. Um, I knew last week that I was going to be announcing that I was leaving. Um, and so I wanted to make sure I had a discussion with our administration prior to having the board make a decision. <coughs> And I communicated that to all of you last week on Thursday. So we asked all of our administrators. Um, Mr. Davis was in the room as the technology special ed elementary, middle school, high school administration, uh, Mr. McGrath and I, and we talked through the implications of this decision. And what happens if I'm not there to lead um, in that process? Um, and the reality is this, once the decision is made, a lot of this groundwork has had to have been done by me um, and working with individual building principals. Once the decision is made, it's Mr. Kasner and Mr. Ty's responsibility with Mr. Zipes to implement the high school. They'll begin, they have a schedule ready to go and they'll begin getting students to schedule that tomorrow, Monday, um, and sign up for those classes. Um, their responsibility picks up once the decision is made the middle school as well, the elementary as well. Um, and to a person unanimously in the room, um, the fact that I am leaving the district um, on August the 1st did not change any administrator's opinion of this move. Um, unanimous, unanimously in the room, uh, they voted that their recommendation to you as a board would be um, to, to, make, to move forward with this decision. Um, those of you that were in the room, was am I speaking uh, truthfully? Okay. Um, so this is a long-term decision. The folks that we have hired to make decisions about the long-term health and programming of our district um, see the implications of not making this decision, and they they do not want to have those things um, happen to our to our schools. So um, that's uh, those are some things that I wanted to make sure that I said to you. Um, along the lines of it's a building decision once the decision is made, you know, for example, um, the middle school has picked out their playground equipment already that they will be adding. They asked me for what budget they would have, and they asked me um, if they can go ahead and, you know, know what that is. So that would be installed this summer prior to students being here in August. Um, the decisions that need to be made in terms of those sort of things behind the scenes, those decisions have already been happening. Um, they're ready to go once the decision is made. Um, these are some additional thoughts here that um, others have provided. Um, 
what I did was the second page is those that thought the benefits outweighed their concerns. So that's why it starts back over on ranked of one. Um, this is not an uncommon theme or practice for fourth and fifth grade students. Um, there are districts around us. Um, there are districts all across the state that have students switching classes. Um, and um, those, those, are, uh, those are things that, that we know and we have people who have worked in those environments. Some of our fourth grade teachers have been departmentalized before in previous districts. They know what it's like um, and they know how to do that. Um, there, here are the top thoughts for those who are in opposition um, to the meeting. We've already talked about this one in terms of former and current employees um, concern. The departmentalization for fourth grade um, was a common theme that was discussed. Um, I will tell you that my time as a superintendent here, um, you pay me to sit here and to communicate to, to speak on behalf of our district. And um, we rarely have administrators and we rarely have teachers here to speak because um, I don't wanna put them in a situation where they're asked questions that they don't feel comfortable answering. Um, all of you can ask fourth grade teachers what they think about this. I hope that you have. I know that some of you have spoken to them. Um, they, um, they participated, I will tell you, in this thought exchange. After speaking with them, I know that they were involved. Um, and, uh, and, and so, uh, that's, that's, we solicit their information and we communicate that. Um, so here's the last thing, um, I, I want to talk about, we've talked about whether this is a long-term student, you know, uh, solution, um, you know, our current high school students, um, in eighth, ninth, 10th grade, we have over a hundred kids in those classes. We're averaging as a district 105 to 110 kids per grade level. Um, our elementary classes, we are slightly, slightly larger in several of them, but there is not a current trend that our enrollment is on the increase in terms of um, seeing an enrollment increase. Enrollment projections um, actually have us as a district trending down, um, the official enrollment projections that are put out. Um, even though we have slightly larger classrooms in a couple of our grades. Uh, so I believe that this addresses our current issues and our long-term issues as a district. Um, it's not a situation where we're gonna get our third grade kids to the high school and all of a sudden we won't have enough space. Um, those things uh, you know, normally work their way out um, and we have larger classes followed by smaller classes. Um, so, the, the one thing that is that would be um, that our middle school staff, our fourth grade teachers, our middle school principals um, are going to need to communicate and to work on, and this is the job of the teachers and the programs, is how do they structure their day? So they will be in four core classes, math, science, social studies, and English. Um, at this level, social studies is a lot of language arts. It's a lot of reading um, informational texts learning about things and then writing about that. Um, it's reading, it's a focused area then. So when you read about social studies, you're, you're implementing, you're doing all of the reading things that you need to do. And then you're writing or you're responding. And that is very heavy language arts um, focus. They've already talked as a fourth grade team about how they partner those two things together. You know, that writing becomes you know, your English class becomes a lot of reading instruction and we do a lot of other things over here in these other courses. Um, fourth grade science is the same way. You're reading those informational things. The other thing that's um, discussed and has, you know, one of the questions they asked from Mrs. Calloway is, do we have any say in how intervention is structured? So the intervention class, it's a whole class period at the end of the day. Do we have a say in how that's structured? And the answer is absolutely yes. The fourth grade team decides what the fourth grade students are doing in their intervention. I can tell you that my fifth grade child during intervention is doing something very different than my seventh grade child in intervention. Because fifth grade is doing focused math, additional math work. Everybody's doing their Alex work during math, or everybody's doing their I-ready language arts during, during intervention, I'm sorry. 
they are structuring that time. So what may have been lost in a, um, you know, with math being 48 minutes, now they have an additional 20 to 25 minutes at the end when you break your intervention period down to have additional math work or additional reading work during that time for all students. Um, intervention is not a study hall where they come in and they're free to do whatever they want. Um, and that's one of the things that I think fourth grade teachers um, liked about the discussion with Mrs. Callowert was they can they know where their kids would need additional help during that time. Um, so it's not like four periods of core and then we're going to gym for the other three periods. Um, they're focused, um, you know, curricular times. Um, What about the bubble kids? Uh, you have a plan for the IEP kids, but what about those kids who are academically on the bubble? Decisions about where to place students in courses, decisions about who goes into the um, English, you know, so the um, fundamentals of English class, for example, is where they have additional work in their language arts curriculum. It's a course they would take for a semester. That is predicated based on recommendations from third grade and how they did on the third grade test. So kids that are struggling, whether they're on an IEP or not, um, or may be assigned to this course uh, to receive that additional support. Um, they're making those decisions on a case-by-case -case basis and saying, you know, this kid needs additional language arts, whether they're on an IEP or not. Um, I know that we have students who are excelling in math and did not do well in the language arts test um, the previous year. So they're taking fundamentals of English and maybe in advanced math at a different time of the day. It's individual and then those decisions are made. Um, the plan accounts for kids along the continuum. It accounts for those things. Um, okay, this is the last thing that is in here that I thought was interesting. And I would encourage you to go out and look at it if you're, um, the responses were very split. Um, the percentages of how people, you know, evaluated their, their answers. Um, but this program identified two groups of people. Um, and the way to look at this is there are 52 people in this little side of the Venn diagram over here. There are 52 people whose answers were very lockstep. They were in line on the things on the left-hand side of this page. And there were 48 people on the right-hand side whose answers were in line with each other, but in total opposition to the people on the left. Very divided feedback and input um, on this thing. So this is one of the um, tools that, you know, helps you understand how some of these things come, you know, come up. Full. So, for example, no departmentalization in side A. 4.9 people who agreed with that the average ranking was 4.9. The people who disagreed with that, the average ranking was 1.3. But in opposition to that on the other side, you have people who said, we need more educational opportunities for fourth and eighth graders. Those who said no departmentalization on the left-hand side said, we don't need educational opportunities for fourth and eighth graders on the right-hand side. So does everybody see the rankings for that? You see where that is outlined? So they were in agreement that we don't want departmentalization and they were in agreement that we don't need more educational opportunities for fourth and eighth graders. And converse to that, we had a people in an agreement that didn't think we sh that departmentalization was not a big problem, but we should also make sure that we have as many opportunities for kids on the other side as possible. Um, this gives you the computer. I didn't do this work. The computer gives you this work. I thought it was interesting to, um, you know, see uh, the feedback on those two sides of things. Oh, there were common uh, answers down the middle. Um, one of those answers is if we have space and we have teachers, then can we bring back elementary art if we make this decision? Um, that was ranked fairly high by both sides of this. Um, uh, the other one is, you know, follow up to see if the grads and CCP courses have helped them complete their college degrees faster or cheaper. Um, we have to connect that, collect that longitudinal information, but the reality is by law, we have to provide them with the opportunity to take college credit plus classes. 
um, whether that helps them get a degree at the end faster or not. Um, we provide the opportunity and we are not legally allowed to dissuade people from taking College Credit Plus. Um, there are neighboring school districts that have had to go to meetings with ODE um, because they've held people out of College Credit Plus courses. Um, and uh, so those are some things that um, I would encourage you to go look at that for the people in the room in terms of um, there were some uh, you know, interesting um, differences in those opinions. So, um, it is a very, it's a very um, polarizing look when you look at it this way, um, that there are people that, that think that by making this decision, we are thinking about the kids. And there are people that are thinking that by making this decision, we're not thinking about the kids, right? Um, the reality is what we have to do as administration is look not only now, but into the future and say, what do we want Greenview schools to look like for our students? And do we want our students to go to a school or to a building where we don't have these opportunities available to them? That's the reality of where we are as a district, um, that programs will have to be cut um, if we don't find a different solution. Um, our administrators, are kid-centered and kid-focused. Um, they, they recognize um, those things, and that has always been a discussion um, as we've been at the table having these plans and discussions. So um, I wanted to share all this information with you. Um, I think I answered the three questions that you asked earlier, Mrs. Trotter. I know you asked me another one earlier about staffing cuts. It is not our intention that this will cut or save any positions. This is not done um, to do so. If there are positions that are cut um, or that are not needed, we have vacancies that those people will have opportunity to move into. Um, for example, we are looking for early elementary teachers and some of our fourth grade teachers um, also have a license to teach kindergarten through third grade. Um, so the, that was not the purpose or the intention of this decision. Um, so if it does happen that we contractually, legally have to make sure we find an opportunity and that nobody, we fill those vacancies with current employees before we look to the outside. Okay. Um, so I wanted to share that because I know that sometimes we ask you for input and you never know what happens to it. Um, right. We ask for input. And the input that we received was there were more people in support of this decision than in opposition. I will tell you that the input that was received has driven discussions for us as administration in the last you know, week um, and a half since, um, since we received it and we came back from spring break. We looked at this together as a staff. Um, we talked about some of these things and the plan for how we would address things in the summer um, in a transition would address the social emotional aspect of kids moving buildings, also the academic aspect of that. Um, so those are some of the things that um, I, I wanted to provide you with information. Um, are there any questions from the board about this information that we share? No, I love the way it's broken down and thanks for your explanation of the if different parts. It's out there on our website. You can go to news and announcement on our webpage and it's there. Um, you can click and follow along. The other thing I did not share, but um, if you scroll to the bottom of this presentation, uh, there's a link. The link is live in the PDF that's on the website. That link will take you to an actual thought exchange report um, that I cannot manipulate or control. So all this information and more is out there. Um, you can click on buttons and see how things look yourself um, in terms of that feedback. So that link is live. That's where we pulled a lot of this information. Um, the second thing that was on my agenda um, is the learning recovery and extended learning plan. ODE required us um, by April 1st to have a, an extended um, a learning recovery plan and extended learning plan that is also published on our website. Um, I'm gonna take you to it and I'm not gonna go through everything in details, but I wanna explain to you the, the plan of what this is and you can go and look at that yourself. Um, we're just required to make the community aware of what this is and where it is. Come on. 
So it looks like this. It's small, I'm trying to blow it up here. Ooh, now it won't stop. Once it stops, we'll go back down. Uh-oh. Okay. Um, this was a template and uh, this is a live living document. As we get more information, we will add to it. Um, so um, what are we doing to identify the academic needs of those kids that are impacted by a COVID shutdown? One of the discussions that we have had administratively that I think it's very important to make sure we make the, you know, the, the point, we've been in school um, as much or more than um, most around us. The academic impact felt by our students is real, but it's not going to be as um, broad as some of those who um, in our county who just returned to school in person last week. <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, that's something that I want to make sure. And the other thing is to, to give credit to our staff. Um, we have been working and intervening with students in classrooms um, from the very beginning of school. We bought tools this year to, to provide benchmarks and assessments for kids and know where they were and how we're progressing. And those things are happening um, as we've gone on all year long to close those gaps. Um, I talked to several third grade teachers about the fourth grade you know, decision, but one of the things that they can tell you is where their kids started at the beginning of the year in their reading levels and where they are now. We're constantly monitoring and assessing these students and we've got a pretty good idea of where they are. Um, and so we can build some plans with that. Um, the other thing um, is that um, we recognize that students who um, were out first semester in virtual learning and came back, um, our staff members, specifically I wanna to speak to like elementary, um, I know that they have provided times in the classroom and times with, su with support where those students have gaps and we're already working to fill in some of those gaps and working to address some of those things. It will be more obvious as we all come back to school next year. Um, but our, our job is to identify where those gaps exist and what barriers do we have to that. Um, so uh, I'm not, I will not read this to you. I don't wanna bore the room with this, but we have to provide, how are we going to assess where those gaps are? Um, I am making the recommendation to our curriculum director and to our principals. We've talked about this as administration. We need to invest in um, programming and resources that will continue to track student progress. So, for example, one of those is iReady. We have it in third through eighth grade right now. iReady, you take a benchmark assessment and it tells you where the kid is and where their gaps are. And then it assigns work to fill in those gaps. Okay. It is being used in our middle school in fifth through eighth grade right now as a part of their language arts, as a part of their intervention, and kids are bringing things home to do with that. It's a regular benchmarking, so they take one at the beginning of the year, one in the middle of the year, and one at the end, and you know where they are. So we're already doing that. Um, we're looking to expand that into different grades um, and to make sure that that resource is available to our staff. It's an expense. Um, we've talked. We're getting the money from COVID relief funds. And we need to spend it on those sort of things. Um, elementary is using DRA for reading already. We'll continue to do that. We know where our kids are. Um, there are free resources out there online, the ODE math diagnostics, the ODE restart readiness assessments, things like that will be used. And then Alex is another program, our fifth through eighth grade math programs are using. They like it. Uh, I think that we'll continue with it um, at the middle school. But we're looking at doing iReady, I think, right, as I sit here today, iReady in math and language arts um, at the elementary through middle school, and then Alex in five through eight, because that's what those teachers are already working on. Um, so um, we're collecting data as we go. This plan is broken down, and what are you doing right now to collect data? What are you doing in the summer to collect data? And what are you doing going forward to collect data? Um, 
So we already have data. We'll review also the end of course assessment data and we will assign students to specific classes based off of uh, their needs. Um, so those are some things that we are doing in terms of evaluating where students are and evaluating gaps. What do we do once we identify the gaps? Um, a couple plans that we have worked on and we're um, sharing, gonna begin sharing that information next week. Um, we will be offering summer school opportunities for students at the high school like we always do in credit recovery. The, the best way that we know whether kids got it or not is if they got credit for the class, right? If you don't get credit, you can't graduate because you need the credits and you need the in-the-course assessment. So high school, um, 9 through 12, we'll be offering credit recovery programs like we always do. We anticipate we'll have more students taking that this year than last, so we'll probably have to spend, you know, have more staff members involved. Will that run through the bridge? Um, they use the program that the bridge uses. Uh, Mr. Adkins is not in charge of it. Typically, like Mrs. Sweet does summer school. Um, we may be having more, have more uh, staff members that need to support her. Uh, we're trying to keep it to a one to 15 ratio of staff to students um, in the summer programs. And did I read somewhere that if they take summer school and they end up passing their courses, then they don't have to pay. But if they don't pass, then they have to pay an amount of money for attending. Typically, um, in the past, students had to pay for summer school okay. um, because if you failed the course and you're taking it, there's an expense to, to do that. Um, I believe at our last discussion um, that we are offering summer school this this summer without um, any charges, whether they pass or fail the course. Um, we the failure means they don't get credit and they don't get to con continue to move on to the next course. But we we have paid for they'll be utilizing credit recovery programs attached to things we've already paid for. So the additional expense for us is the staffing, not the programming. That is going to be covered by um, COVID yeah, COVID yeah. Um, I, I part of our discussion was that originally because we want to make sure kids start it that they finish it and there's the you know the carrot parent make sure they keep showing up that's what we've done in the past for those but we we just we don't want that to be a barrier to kids um we don't want to be a barrier to kids making up coursework this summer so um cost should not be a barrier to to getting back on track um kindergarten through eighth grade and speaking with the elementary principal and speaking with the middle school principal um at younger grades the priority still needs to be reading and math fundamental scores um, if you can't read, um, you have a hard time being successful in any courses going forward. And so what we are looking to create would be at the same time that we're offering high school, summer school, which would be three weeks in June from nine to 12 in the morning. It's what it always is. It's 15 days, three weeks in June, nine to 12 in the morning. Um, for students uh, who need additional support, um, we're looking for staff members to create a classroom setting, not a computerized. Now we're not slapping them on a computer in first grade and saying here to learn how to read. Okay, a classroom teacher providing instruction um, that will be mixed with, you know, things that first grade kids need, <laughs> outside time, you know, all of those things that are age appropriate, but providing reading and math fundamental instruction for those students to help begin the process of closing some gaps. Um, I would rec we are recommending that students who have been virtual for the year, this would be a great way for them to get back into school. It's a smaller class setting. Um, there, there will be things in it that begin that transition back in. Um, and so that, that's our plan for the summer. Um, in terms of trying to stop some summer slide, of kids going away for two months and losing progress that we've had, but also um, identify. Now we will be using the resources that we have, right? Kids in middle school, they'll be using iReady to help the teacher understand where their gaps are, um, or in third and fourth grade as well, if they're already using that program, um, because we wanna make sure that it's focused and intentional. Um, so if you're a teacher um, and you're listening at home or you're in the room, um, we're gonna we're gonna need staff members for that. We're all obviously going to pay staff members for that. 
Um, there's a summer school rate in our contract and we'll give them additional time to pre prepare every day for those because it's going to be instructional. Um, it's not going to be monitoring kids on a computer. It's going to be instructional. Um, part of what I talked about earlier is I, it is our goal and our discussions have been that third grade, current third grade kids would be doing that work with fourth grade staff members in the middle school if that's the decision that is, is to move to the middle school. They could be in the building with the people they're going to be and begin to see and feel what that looks like. Um, that, that is one of those plans also as a transition. Um, we've spoken to the Greene County Public Library. Um, they're going to offer their summer reading program um, where hopefully we can have some high school students that, you know, like we have in the past that partner with them, that do some, you know, reading things to, to get books they like, to read, to have rewards for reading those books. You know, you fill in your chart, get your stickers at the end of the summer, you get rewards for having so many books that you've read, things like that. We have offered them that if they want to offer programs like they've traditionally done in the past, um, you know, they bring in the reptile guy or whatever it is. My kids, you know, have gone to those things that if they would like to offer those programs, but space is a concern, then we would offer our buildings them free of charge to use for some of those enrichment, just fun opportunities. Um, I think right now they're looking to provide um, a lot of those things remotely just because they're still not back in, you know, fully with library stuff, but um, we're going to continue to work with them uh, on that. We may be looking at offering some enrichment opportunities in July. Um, I'm going to hypothetically throw something out there. If our high school, you know, art teacher wants to do a, you know, a ceramics, you know, class type of thing, they can come and kids can be in the building. A lot of those opportunities and things that we weren't able to do as much this year, schools in our county are, are doing a summer like music kind of boot camp thing because they weren't able to play or sing, you know, this summer. And so can we get into a bigger space in our orchestra? We don't have an orchestra, but, you know, um, their band, their orchestra, their choirs, you know, put something together for a week and then, you know, do a show at the end of the week type of thing. So we're looking at some of those opportunities um, and uh, working on those behind the scenes right now. And as we have more information, um, we'll share that to this document. Um, the other thing that needs to be a component of this, and this is a big piece um, that the governor has really asked us to do, is the social emotional aspect of the return. Um, we are working with the Greene County um, ESC. They provide mental health therapists for us in our buildings. Um, those mental health therapists, we have increased this year. We went from three to four days of, of services. Um, it's possible that, you know, if there is a need to increase those number of services, um, that's all going to be driven by needs, but that's one of those things that we do need um, on a regular basis. Can you use the health and wellness fund or the... Yes, and what we have done in the last couple of years is we've used the, the wellness funds that come from the governor's office to help pay for those contracts. Um, that's how we've been able to expand some of our counseling services and school nurse services. We've had one in every building right now that we've paid for out of the wellness um, and mental health therapists. Um, in addition to that, we're working with the ESC and going through a whole child project. Um, there's something I absolutely forgot and deleted here, so I have to go back to that one, but um, whole child project, which is um, identifying uh, needs assessments for the buildings, what are some things that our students need, and then providing training for our staff around those, whether it's trauma-informed care, how staff can identify whether a kid's in trauma and connect them with the right resources. Um, you know, we, we know because we've experienced already this year, you know, we had, a, we had some students that came back after Christmas break. They were virtual for the first part of the year, came back after Christmas break and they really struggled with the transition. Um, and, you know, there was some separation anxiety with that, right? And they've been home with their parents for a long time. And so we, we know that we have to equip our staff to identify these things um, and, and educate them on some of those things. So we're looking to help uh, for help with the ESC um, on some of this whole, tri whole child project, trauma-informed classrooms, things like that. Um, so those are some of the social emotional things. The other thing is we've, we've introduced PBIS this year um, and the, the idea is to reward positive behavior. So you've seen the little cartoon Ram at the middle school that says, you know, Rams are responsible. Rams are 
uh, respectful rams are reflective and there's lessons and programs around that um, i know our elementary uh you know, was going was preparing to do elementary like classroom um, lessons around those three words and things that needs to continue to be fleshed out um, because it's less about um, correcting the negative behavior and more about reinforcing the positive behavior um, and that's the culture shift that you know um, comes along with pbis and that implementation um, that that is most successfully implemented currently at our middle school um, their ram pride club um, group has been uh, transitioned with that um, and they've done some really good jobs this year and kids getting you know ram pride cards and and ram bucks or whatever they call them um, and so those are some things that are social emotional aspects of school as well trying to make it a good environment for them when they come back um, so those are some things this plan is out there um, we'll continue to uh, add to it and evolve, um, but it's there. Um, the last thing is personal. I added this to the list, and I would just like to thank the board um, and the community. Um, it's been my home for 12 years. It's a very difficult decision for me and my family, but we feel like it's um, a good time for us and a good opportunity for us. Um, I sat down today and I was just writing through um, Facebook is weird like this. It reminds you every time you put something on Facebook and it comes back up um, uh, on those anniversaries. And I love it. But I also realized that um, the month of March uh, has been really uh, an instrumental and pivotal time for me. Um, I was hired to be the head football coach and a math teacher here 12 years ago in March. And those memories came up and every time that I shared something about those opportunities. There was excitement and um, anticipation for what was next. Um, and I wanna thank Joe Parrish and um, for mentoring me and giving me an opportunity to become a principal 10 years ago. Um, Ken Esselstein for putting up with the young guy in the room um, and, and allowing me to lead. And he managed things in the building that allowed us to do some things uh, as the high school principal. Um, and um, again, Joe Parrish for seeing something in me um, eight years ago that encouraged me to apply to be the superintendent and for that board to give me an opportunity. Um, and, and I've had opportunities to, to, to leave before, but it was never right and it was never um, the right time. Um, but it's the right time for us as a family now. And I just appreciate your support. Um, we have a lot of red and blue at our house. Uh, it's all my kids know. And um, it's bittersweet, but I just want to say thank you. Um, and thank you for your support. And thank you for um, the way that you've led our district and um, continue to do so. For those that are concerned about me leaving, um, I'm here through July. And um, I can assure you that I'm going to give you the best I've got between now and July to make sure that this plan is is ready to go on August 1, um, so the next person can step in and be successful. That was a big part of our discussion last week as administrators. Um, the team that's in the room that has to do the work, uh, that work begins um, now. And if we're still doing it in August, right, then we're behind. Um, if, we're still, if we're still doing it in August, we're behind. Um, so we're committed to doing the work and I'm committed to being here um, this isn't like other jobs where you give a two weeks notice and you leave. Um, I'm going to fill my fulfill my contract and be be a part of what's going on here. So, um, thank you, thank you for your support, and um, I appreciate the encouragement and things that have happened in the last couple of weeks as this process played out. So, thanks. That's all I have for Superintendent. Well, we want to thank you as well for everything you've done for our district. Uh, your leadership has been excellent and very professional. And I've had the opportunity to work with many superintendents and many administrators in my career as a teacher and as a parent and as a grandparent. And we have been very fortunate to have, to Mr. have Mr. Sievers lead our district. And uh, so, so we wanna thank you as well Thanks. and wish you the best. Thanks. So, thank you so much for the update and the explanation. Um, 
and we will move on to new business. Okay. Number one, approve Student Protective Agency Incorporated for student insurance carrier for the 2021-2022 school year. Number two, approve the proposed building realignment for the 2021-2022 school year as follows. Greenview Elementary School, preschool through third grade. Greenview Middle School, fourth grade through seventh grade. Greenview High School, eighth grade through 12th grade. Number three, approve the repair agreement with Cincinnati Floor in the amount of $29,000 to sand, smooth, seal, paint, and finish the Greenview High School gym floor. Number four, approve the interagency agreement and MOU between Green County Public Schools, Board of Developmental Disabilities, Educational Service Agency, Early Intervention, and Council on Rural Services Head Start for the 2021-2022 school year. Move. I'll second. Um, I wanna point out real quick before you vote on number three, I shared information with you as a board ahead of time. Um, we received two quotes for this. Um, and we have a 20 year old gym floor at the high school and every once in a while you need to sand it all the way down and um, repaint and redo it. Every year, what we do is we reseal the gym floor um, sand off just a little bit of the top and reseal it. And we typically the company we use for that is Robers. Um, Robers does that work a lot, um, but Robers does not typically redo entire gym floors the same way that Cincinnati floor does. So Robers gave us a quote to do that work. And they also gave us several recommendations and references of people they've done that for. Um, we contacted them. And uh, I think it's worth noting that those schools that had previously worked with Robers for that um, you know, are looking to redo their gym floors because it's time to do that. And they're not soliciting quotes from Robers. Um, Cincinnati flooring is the gold standard when it comes to floors. Um, they, they do all the major college ones. They, they, are, they are the top of the line. Um, it is more expensive than Robers. So um, it's below the threshold of what we're required to ask but Mr. McGrath and I felt like since we're asking you to approve the not, not the cheapest option, we need to tell you that up front and give you a chance to vote on it. Okay. Any Thank questions you. about that? Nope. Okay. Uh, Angela Reagan? Yes. Todd Ireland? Yes. Scott Powers? Yeah. Teresa Wallace? Yes. Suzanne Arthur? Yes. Motion passed five to zero. And now we move on to personnel. Number one, approve the following supplemental positions for the 2020-2021 school year. Rick Gonzalez, Assistant Spring Musical Director. Dana Matt, Middle School Track and Field Volunteer. Number two, approve the following supplemental positions for the 2021-2022 school year. TJ Milby, Head Boys Soccer Coach. Nikki Hurley, head girls soccer coach. Evan Grooms, head girls tennis coach. Brian Haynes, head high school football coach. Paul Thompson, head high school boys golf coach. Mark Mash, head high school girls golf coach. Number three, approve the resignation of Isaac Sieber, superintendent, effective July 31st, 2021. Number four, approve the resignation of Laura Hansen, custodian, effective May 8th, 2021. Number five, approve the following classified substitutes. Laura Hansen, custodian. I wanted to ask if in number one is the 20, is that correct? Yes. That okay, correct. I just want to make sure. Yes. Okay. Dana is currently um, assisting with track and field. Okay. And the musical is done, but we okay. cannot prove it. And we have Laura is resigning, but then coming back as a sub. Yes. So Laura, Laura has the opportunity to move to a different employer that work that has um, a shift that would conflict with her evening custodian responsibilities, but she's still willing to work, um, you know, shifts that would work. So um, she can't come to work, you know, earlier in the day, but she still be an evening custodian for us. So, which is helpful because we're short on evening custodians. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We have a move. I'll move. I'll second. Angela Reagan? Yes. Todd Ireland? Yes. Howard? Yeah. Teresa Wallace? Yes. Suzanne Arthur? Yes. 
pass five to zero. Okay. And at this time, we have a 10 minute. Is there anything else that they would like to? That we added address? at the end, if there's anything else you would like to address. <laughs> Couple of things, uh, Amber Charter four three four seven Pueblo Trail. Thank you. A couple of questions about the um, learning recovery and extended planning. Um, just as a concerned mom, um, my son can't wear a mask. He like tries to ventilate and has panic attacks. So <clears throat> obviously, I had talked to Mr. Sievers about um, getting him tested and evaluated for the key. Um, thankfully, I brought it to Mr. Sievers because. It wasn't going to be done. That being said, with all of the things that we have going on through the summer, like I know obviously he can't do summer school because it'll require a mask. Is there, will these programs that we currently do, like Prodigy and stuff, will those be available through summer so we can still work on them? Our licenses extend through the summer. Okay. Um, they're still available. Um, I would say to you that. Um, child needs to be involved in those programs that there are all there are ways to have exceptions to um, requirements that you need to address that with us and we can see if that applies okay um i think that was it thank you thank you anything else If not, at this time, we will move into executive session to consider the employment compensation of a public employee or official, and there will be no business after executive session. 820. Do you have a motion? Move. Move. Oops, I'll second. Uh, Scott Ireland? Yes. Scott Powers? Yeah. Therese Wallace? Yes. Suzanne Arthur? Yes. Angela Reagan? Yes. Motion passed five to zero. Executive session at three twenty three. Thanks for coming.